Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to my chat about investing in quantum computing. Um, I'll get started today with um, a little bit about my background. I think it's probably helpful for everyone to, um, to just hear my journey into quantum computing. And it, it might sound straightforward because, you know, I do have a PhD in physics, but it actually wasn't quite like that. So um, I do have a PhD in theoretical physics, but it wasn't really until I did my MBA that I actually learned a little bit about um, finance. And I, I say finance, but it's actually more uh, the commercial world and something that I think it's quite important for anyone thinking about um, starting their own company in, in quantum computing in particular. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I, I actually find that it would be really helpful for uh, for scientists to, to learn basic principles such as time value of money or risk return, something that I wasn't aware of when, when I started. So I spent half of my professional career in finance. Um, I worked at the hedge fund, structured derivatives, then even started the biotech um, BC fund, which you know has a lot of similarities uh, as, a, as an industry to quantum computing. And, and then the other half I spent um, working as an operator for early stage companies, in particular deep technology in biotech, AI, quantum tech. Um, so I've seen quite a fair bit of teams uh, trying to make it out of academia into the into the commercial world, and and I thought you know it'd be helpful if I shared some of my learnings um, over these few years. So today I'm the co-founder and president and CEO CEO of Orca Computing, um, but I won't be talking much about uh, Orca. Um, you know, but always feel free to get in touch. Uh, always happy to chat about it. Um, okay, so investing in quantum computing, uh, obviously very hot field, increasingly attractive over the past few years. And the reason is because um, the promise is it's a new paradigm. Uh, the opportunity of a new quantum computing platform is not something that comes about uh, often. And I think investors recognize this. But this also means that investors are mostly looking for potential breakthroughs. Uh, they're not necessarily as focused as on revenue as maybe other investors are in other fields. And they want to see the hint of something that could be disruptive. And we're still at that stage. Now, um, just some high level data. In the past eight years, there's been an increase, a tenfold increase in the number of deals, the amount of dollars that have gone into the space. And, and we started, and you know, we have seen actually um, top VC funds uh, investing in, in several companies and even uh, corporate venture arms as well. Now, let's say you have an idea for a quantum startup. You just finished your PhD. You are an academic. You're a postdoc. The first question I would ask you is, um, is there a company in your idea? And um, that's not straightforward because there's a lot of things that your idea needs to take in order to actually uh, make sense as a company. And some of the questions I would ask is, is there a problem for the solution that you're trying to solve? Is, um, is, um, is the science around um, the idea well validated? And could you stay still in academia a little longer to validate further? And I think a key question is, if you had more money, would you move faster? And sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes more money won't really necessarily turn into faster progress. Um, but if the answer to all of these questions is yes, um, then I would ask you, are you ready as a founder to start a company? And um, I'm talking mostly to academics at this point. But there's major differences between academia and, and the entrepreneurial world. And some of them are obvious, but um, some of them are not. And, and it might not be fit for you and your co-founders. So can you, can you think about results as opposed to just you know, maybe satisfying your curiosity? Do you understand that you'll be 
forced into thinking about exits and bringing revenue uh, for your investors? And can you draw a plan and stick to it going forward? Okay, so um, just for the next couple of minutes, I'd like to spend some time um, digging into the mind of a VC investor. And of course, you know, every investor is different, but um, there's some obvious points that I think are helpful to remind everyone. Uh, the first one is that uh, an investor, its primary goal is to find companies that have the potential for outside returns. And I mentioned this in the past, but this means the opportunity for disruption. Uh, is the platform, is the offering that you're building something that could turn into a unicorn? And if it's not, VCs will probably be not as interested. And that doesn't mean that Maybe you can build a company around it, but it might mean that um, you should probably seek other sources of funding. Now, investors do care about risk, though, and they want to be compensated for it. Uh, not only that, they look for risk mitigation strategies um, around your company and your team. So is there any residual value if everything fails? Will, for instance, it be able to package your company as a as an acu hire uh, to a large corporate if you don't achieve the necessary milestones or is your IP strategy well thought? Then there's timing. Uh, it could be that the technology is too early for the investor or that you're actually coming in too late in the, in the uh, life cycle of their fund. And so my recommendation would be to target funds that are newer just because then they have at least around 10 years for them to wait until the technology matures and that's particularly important for um, for quantum technologies and then um, do you fit into the portfolio in a way that diversifies the portfolio uh, for them properly so are they focused on a particular industry and then they invest across different companies in that industry like quantum computing or are they actually looking at different technologies and then just picking the best companies that they think uh, fit in those technologies. And then the level of conviction. Uh, how are they building conviction? How do they feel comfortable with um, the, the, the technology, the team, and so on? And finally, uh, what is the degree of technical knowledge? And if they are not very technical, you'll need to find ways to actually educate them and make sure that they, they get there. Now, these are the obvious points, but I think it's very interesting to also look at things that maybe are not so often discussed, but are very, very important. Most of them are in the psychology of the investor. And so what one of the things that I think um, many potentially might not agree, but is very important is Investors rely heavily on pattern recognition. So they, they will make decisions pretty quickly based on whether things match what they've seen in the past or not. So um, have they seen this approach succeed or fail in the past? Have they seen other industries go through the same process and how does this um, fit within um, their views? They will also seek external validation, which means they will talk to others. They will talk to other academics. They'll talk to other investors. And so your job is also not only to make sure that you push the technology, but that you communicate it well um, to those around you. They will value simplicity. So generally, uh, technology investing is already a complex field. So they want to start with something very simple, simple terms, simple cap table, simple team, and ultimately, even simple technology. If everything looks too complicated, they will shy away. And finally, well, they are human. So they're subject to fear of missing out, fear of looking stupid. Um, they fall trap of the sexy factor. And so in trying to position yourself in front of an investor, <clears throat> it's important to understand that there's this diet between the fear of mess missing out. So you know, they want to they wanna join the company in principle. They want to be part of quantum computing and, and your approach. But at the same time, they don't ever want to look stupid um, if everything fails. So just making sure that you can avoid that and you can show them that they will miss out is, is a little bit of a dance. 
<coughs> and an art in and on itself. Okay, so then, you know, I, I think generally quantum computing startups are no different from other venture-backed startups. Um, they rely on the team and, you know, the networks that the team brings to the table and how the hiring is structured. They rely on the technology, the IP around it, how different from other platforms it is and, and what's the potential. And, and then they, they, need, they need a focus on, on a roadmap and execution. Um, but are they so, so similar to other, um, other industries? And, and there's, there's four main points in which I think quantum computing companies are different from other venture-backed tech startups. And I think when you are trying to position yourself in front of investors, it is worth for you to, to think about this. So the first one is that our industry is very young. And so we are all inventing the industry as we go, which means that we have to make sure we are vocal about our views, we are thoughtful about our views, and we talk to others. Um, as much as possible. Then the horizons are longer term. So uh, this ties up with what I said earlier. It is important to identify funds that will be interested in in quantum computing, um, and because it fits within their their mindset and and their technical um, situation. And then it is hard to understand. So one of our jobs as as quantum computing startups is to communicate and then communicate and communicate again. And uh, this is important at all levels, uh, from investors who know a lot, there's always more than they can know, to even the general public um, on, on what we're doing. And then just before closing, I'd like to leave you with a few um, remarks put for thought um, on whether you are a hardware company or a software company. Um, these are some of the things that I think uh, we should all be thinking about as an industry. So if you're a hardware company, I think it's very important for you to understand where you fit in the quantum ecosystem and the quantum stack, if there's such a thing. Um, uh, it is important that you articulate what is your MVP and, and do it clearly and focus on achieving that. But at the same time, don't lose the focus on the long-term ambition because remember at the end of the day, investors are here for the potential for massive disruption. Um, I think it's important that you make sure you're different from others. And not only that, you should show that you are actually the best at what you're doing. And I think this is key because as an investor and when I've been on the other side, if I don't see that a team has an edge over everyone else, if I don't see that that person, those, those people are the best people to be doing what they're trying to do, then I'll just try to find the best people and fund those. Um, and then if you're a quantum software company, um, it is also very important to articulate your edge because from an outsider point of view, it's just very easy to see everyone just looking the same. So um, articulating your edge, communicating where you fit again in the quantum stack. And then I would encourage um, quantum software companies to actually think more in terms of providing infrastructure than focusing on use cases, which I think will, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a moving target and not, doesn't have that potential for disruption as much as building really the infrastructure that will power um, the quantum. Uh, revolution. So uh, thank you all for your time and I'm happy to answer questions if there's any time left.